Um, so it's my real pleasure to uh, introduce you to our speaker today. Uh, this is the first uh, speaker that we're hosting um, on the uh, Center for Systems and Community Design. Um, and so very excited that we're able to get Jonathan here to find the time in his schedule to come to work all the way from Vancouver. Um, Jonathan is an accomplished designer, systems thinker, and educator who uh, really has a passion for addressing complex issues uh, or different problems uh, through the lens of uh, design thinking. And uh, I think, uh, you know, what's really unusual uh, about Jonathan uh, is that he's done a lot of his uh, design work uh, in the area of the social and uh, healthcare uh, issues. And until recently, Jonathan was uh, the head of the healthcare design lab um, and associate professor in communication design at the Emily Carr University of Arts and Design, which is a very renowned art institution in Vancouver, Canada. Over the summer, he stepped down from his academic role and started his own uh, new company called the Captive Design Strategies, aimed to offer a uh, unique blend of the co-creative and participatory design research processes uh, and practices with broad-based partners. So we're really thrilled to have Jonathan with us today. We had an amazing uh, workshop with some of the Vancouver faculty and staff uh, today, uh, which has been really, really helpful in terms of helping us think about uh, some new uh, research projects that are probably on the horizon. So without further ado, um, let me bring Jonathan uh, to the stage, and I hope that you will stretch your imagination in terms of what's possible in public health research and practice. Thank you. Thank you. So is the mic level okay? Everybody in the back can hear me all right? Yeah. Perfect. Thanks, Terry. So I'm here to talk about healthcare, sort of, but I uh, have no particular experience or credibility at all in healthcare. Um, my expertise is more around emerging trends in, in design and design thinking, as Terry said, and how this new way of imagining design might provide some clues about how to begin untangling some of the huge issues in healthcare. So who I am, so as uh, Terry mentioned, up until about six months ago, I headed up a research center at an art and design school in Vancouver called the Health Design Lab. And it was dedicated to applying design thinking and design research met methodologies to the so-called wicked problems in healthcare. I was lucky enough to have been able to apply that thinking to many projects over several years, and I'm gonna talk about some of those projects a little later today. But first I thought I'd start with a more general sense of the sometimes negative role that design can play in healthcare. So the next few examples were given to me by the VP of uh, Health Authority in Vancouver. Um, so we're gonna start with this one, which is an operating room. So a key subsystem within a bigger hospital system, and this is one ex small example of two, um, two pieces of equipment in OR. And it always takes the audience a few moments to get the problem here. Everybody see it? So the keyboard's backwards. So doesn't that strike you as completely phenomenally insane to design keypads in a completely different ways within the same context? So um, if a clinician has several digital tools to, ma to, to manage and something goes wrong and stress gets ratcheted up or, or lightning goes down, what's going to happen in that situation? We can read and decipher it for sure, but we don't want to have to read and decipher different things in different moments. It slows everything down. So in high stress, we typically revert to what we know. And here's an even worse example. So these are three packages. From my perspective as a designer, quite a decent packaging solution for medicine. Nice typography, they're color coded. Any normal graphic designer would be quite happy with that design. Um, the one on the left is normal saline and completely safe. The one in the middle is sterile water, relatively safe, but it might cause some burning. The one on the right is potassium chloride, and I'm told that it's enough to kill somebody if accidentally given in the wrong circumstances. And these three packages did exist within the same hospital in Vancouver until they realized what they'd done wrong and they pulled it. So the designer made them identical in every respect, except for a small area of color and very small type. They valued the look and the feel of those packages, their visual unity, all good design things, over the fact that one is benign, one is mostly safe, and one is potentially lethal. So why in the world would we ever want to put somebody in that position? 
because essentially in both of those examples, we've created a system that actively encourages error. When a mistake happens, we blame the person who ultimately makes the mistake and we call it human error. But it wasn't, it was the system that was at fault. We designed for that error. By designing those packages that way, we ensured that some kind of accident was going to happen. So this is another example. This is one of my favorites. Um, it, it's a great example of, of this beautiful but naive confidence that people have in the power of communication design to actually affect behavior. So at the bottom clearly is a, a typical hand sterilizing unit. Is there anyone who's not familiar with it? They're completely ubiquitous. Do we think that there's anyone out there who doesn't know what that design, what that object is or what, what we're supposed to do with it? They, they, they didn't think so. So in the hospital, they put a poster up. So um, because compliance isn't 100%, it never is, and I guess ultimately never will be, but we're still looking for 100% compliance with these things in every hospital entrance. So um, they, they designed a poster, put it up, um, and they made it crooked, but it didn't work. So they're surprised. They go, well, why didn't this poster work? It tells people exactly what they're supposed to do. So they figured, okay, if one doesn't work, we're gonna do three. <laughs> So I love it because it shows three different things or a few different things. This weird but predictable love of posters in hospitals, at least in Canada. You go into any hospital in Canada and the walls are papered with these horrible little posters. They're all conflicting. They're all eight and a half by 11. They're all fighting your attention so they all get ignored. But second and more tragically, it demonstrates this misplaced confidence in communication design to actually affect a change in behavior. Tragic because it's based on one simple fallacy that people are logical beings and we're not. The logic in this case is that hands spread germs, therefore to stop that particular spread, we just need to sterilize our hands. Okay, so far. But the fallacy assumes that if people understand that logic, they will in fact sterilize their hands. But it's naive because it's a highly simplistic way of interpreting human behavior. Uh, in a project I'll be showing you later, I had a student come to me and say, so Jonathan, I work at this uh, store called Lush, which sells cosmetics um, and hand products. And she says, I was selling this product to this nurse, and she whispered to, me, whispered to me later, she goes, so we have these hand sterilizers at work, and what I do is I go up to them and I pretend to pump it, then I wring my hands and pretend. And the reason I do that is because it dries out my hands, so I need a product that's going to help me with my dry hands. So. That, that, was, that was really a horrible uh, sort of acknowledgement of what reality was, but it was also very human. Uh, people do behave that way. People do the funniest things for the oddest reasons. So how do we get there? No designer ever sets out to cause a problem. Our job is to solve them. So I think the reason is rooted in how design has evolved and how many of us, both designers and non-designers, are stuck in outmoded and potentially dangerous ways of, of, of understanding what design really is. So I'm gonna give you a very, I promise, brief history of how design thinking has evolved over the last few decades. So this is what I'll call design 1.0. Designer as artist, make it pretty. So historically, design comes from this place of decoration, of simply making it pretty. And that's still evident today. Design is often added after the core thinking has already been done and the product development has already happened. We're often asked to collaborate after the engineering's happened. We might be asked to consider ergonomics or to resolve a layout. Essentially, okay, we've done all the hard here's the stuff, can you make it look good? Designer is translator in a sentence. Uh, here's the thing, make it clear. And this is kind of the root of my own training back in the 70s and 80s. So we're asked to present information or product interfaces that are legible, clear, and easy to understand, which is great and it's important, but that's what happened in that packaging design. Uh, designer was asked to make it clear and legible and unified, and they did. Um, in the packaging designer uh, example, they had no idea as to the significance of the content of those packages. They weren't brought into that and likely were never told what those packages contained. So what both of these notions of design have in common is their inclusion after the fact. That is, after the problem has been described and up to a point already solved. But by involving design at the end of the conceptualization and development process, it can only ever add to. It's not really ever part of the essential part of. It's something that gets stuck on later. 
What we aren't being asked to do is how a problem space might be understood differently if we were involved from the beginning. And as the problem space has become more complex and designing for health and healthcare is, is about the most complicated, or sorry, complex problems that are out there, design needs to be considered right from the beginning. So if that's what needs to change from the outside, what about the inside? How do designers need to evolve to be able to be part of a more credible solution-based process where design's an integral part of the solution? How do we approach it? If design isn't about making it pretty or making it clear, what is it about? So I think design, all the disciplines of design are ultimately about shaping human experience or behavior. So I show the Steve Jobs pick, I'll reassure you, I'm not gonna tell another iPhone story for sure. Um, I'm not even gonna talk about Apple. And for the record, um, if you haven't read the Steve Jobs bio, it's fascinating. It's, it's actually, it's a little more detailed than anybody would ever wanna know, but, it, but it's quite interesting. And for the record, so Steve Jobs is not a designer, but he was a visionary and a champion of design. He saw possibilities intuitively and he was arrogant and powerful enough to make those visions happen. There were no incremental steps for him, no sort of band-aids, no add-ons. So my purpose in showing him is this wonderful anecdote, which uh, if there are any architects or urban planners in the audience, you may know. In 1999, after he got turfed from Apple the first time, I think, he engaged uh, Peter Boland to design a new building for Pixar. And as everything he did, he managed the project. I'm sure that the architect just hated working with him. But he did one really interesting thing. When he took over Pixar, he inherited a diverse group that wanted to be housed in three separate buildings. He wanted the animators in one, the scientists in a second, and the administration in a third. And so that's really a physical manifestation of the silos that we all experience in academia and in healthcare. But Jobs had this belief that the right kind of building, whoops, sorry. Sorry, I'm missing a slide. He had this belief that the right kind of building could do great things for a culture. And the culture he wanted to foster was an inherently creative one. He instinctively understood that creativity flourishes in an environment that fosters unplanned connections, especially between people. So he insisted on one large open style atrium with only one set of washrooms at the opposite end of the building on the other floor, forcing people to walk through the atrium on their way to the washrooms, which is a big open space, oddly just on the, by happenstance bumping into people from other departments. So the building is used widely as an example of how structure can support creativity, in this case, by getting people to connect with people they otherwise would never meet. So the point is the design, whether it's a building or a keypad, directly affects behavior. And if design can affect behavior, it can shift a culture. So that gets us to this stage, design 3.0, designer is change agent, behavior change. So up to this point, the designer is still seen as an expert. Uh, we're somebody who applies our outside expertise to solving someone else's problem. So at best, we're seen as visionaries, innovators, shining this glorious light towards the future. Someone like Buckminster Fuller, Mies van der Rohe, we'd look at Steve Jobs. But at worst, we're seen as dilettantes, making things pretty, while engineers do all the hard work. So while those stereotypes have some basis in reality, neither is particularly apt or helpful. The best of us are good innovators, and we are uh, trained at aesthetics, but there's no power in that, no sustainability or replicability. Both are rooted in the individual. So essentially you're only ever gonna get as good of a product at the end as the designer skills whom you hire. And that varies radically. So because designers are a root problem focused, we've had to evolve our practice to be able to persist, participate in these large complex problems. But before we look at that, I wanna look a little more at those problems. What are their characteristics? So we use the phrase wicked problems. I'm not sure if it's part of your jargon or not, but it is part of mine. So these two, Riddle and Weber, coined the phrase uh, in the early 70s to describe problems that seem to be unsolvable. So here's a quote. I think we can all relate to this. Problems that are so big and so complicated that even the manner in which we approach them seems difficult. There's no starting point, no way in, and no easily seen way out. Problems that have no apparent solutions, they're constantly shifting. The very nature of these problems uh, means that solutions, every time you engage in a solution, you've created three new problems. And you sort of fix those and you're creating other new problems. Everything you do touches five other things. We don't know how to start and get into that. 
problems with many diverse interconnections. So each problem that's a wicked problem is connected to five other things and it, it keeps spreading. And problems where the stakes are huge, um, where getting it wrong, getting the answer or the proposed solution wrong can have huge radical outcomes, particularly in healthcare. So here's sort of a humorous example of one small part of a problem. So a few years ago, we've been working with the health authority on a data collection and visualization product uh, <clears throat> project. We were asked to look at how we might represent data on a team's performance in real time. So they were collecting, and I'm sure that this is the case with what you do, data is collected all the time. Uh, it's, it's coherent, it's dense, it's deep, and it's largely used for reporting upwards. Usually it goes to government or to hospital admin to make sure that they're meeting certain targets. Very little is useful at the small level. So a team on the floor may not be able to get data about their own performance in real time so that they can change what they do. And that's what we were asked to look at. So we had two champions from the health authority in Canada we were working with, and they were great. They worked with my class at the time around all these different concepts. They presented the students' work to their own people, and they were encouraged to take it farther with changes. We'd work in the changes that would go back and forth, and nothing was ever going anywhere. We were spinning around and around and around. So eventually I just I pushed pause. I said to the partner, we need to meet with some of your key people to see how we can move from conceptualizing all this stuff into some kind of implementation phase. So that was interesting. We designed these wonderful data collection and visualization processes, and, and these are a couple of examples here, based on the use of iPads. So iPads are easily used, easily disinfected, and they're increasing, increasingly being adopted by clinicians for that ease of use. But we found out a few things in that meeting. Uh, we can't develop iPad apps because IT doesn't support devices, at least in this one health authority, and definitely not Mac devices, only, only PC. So I suggested a mobile web app. Let's do that. We can use it on any platform, but that won't work because in 2015, which is when I was doing this project, they were using Internet Explorer 6. It wouldn't run anything, and the, the web is full of jokes like this about uh, Internet Explorer because it's so slow. Um, so the current version of uh, Internet Explorer in 2015 was 11. They were still on six. So 14 years without a browser upgrade, they, and they, which they couldn't do because they didn't have a budget to upgrade their, their hard the, the, system, the, uh, the computers themselves. And, and with no money for new computers, they couldn't change the system. With no change in the system, they couldn't upgrade the, 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 the browser. It just went on from there. The third problem was there was no consistent Wi-Fi in the hospitals um, and no immediate path to get to consistent Wi-Fi. Next issue uh, were privacy issues. I mean, nothing can be stored on the device itself. It had to be a secure central server, but they couldn't export data from that to a device without another huge investment, which they said they weren't going to do. So we can't use Explorer. I said, well, what about Firesoft? Firefox is open source. We can develop a plugin for it. And they said, well, no, sorry, we're not allowed to, we're not allowed to install Firefox on individuals' computers, although they can do Chrome, which they had, they had no reason why they could install Chrome without Firefox. So last and most frustratingly is staff aren't allowed to use their own phones and tablets at work. So at this point, I'm like, well, well I'm like, why don't we just do it on paper and hand it out? Um, but the beautiful workaround, the thing that they said I was allowed to do is, oh, just call it a pilot project, and then you can do up to eight iPads, no idea where the number eight came, comes from, and we can get permission and you can implement it that way. So that's ultimately where the project went to. So that's a very localized, very small example of a wicked problem. It, it, it's like every time I talk about one solution, there were five reasons why that couldn't happen. So every solution bumps into another problem, and the default in a wicked problem is always no change. That's always the answer. Well, we can't do it because of this and this and this and this. Okay, look, just not change it. So how do we deal with that? What's a possible way forward to avoid that no change default? The overarching argument or, or my overarching uh, sort of thrust of work that I do is that design thinking in general and human-centered design practice in particular is the best tool to address these large, incredibly complex problems in health. I, were, I use the word addressing because the title of the talk suggests that we can solve these problems and I don't think we really can. Uh, I think we can address them in a much better manner than we're doing it, but I don't think we're ever going to get to the final answer because as soon as we do, the system will have changed, we'll be on to something else. So what we really need is a consistent way to address them. So that leads us here. 
to design 4.0, designer is facilitator, co-creation and design. So design's still evolving. As part of our practice now, we've embraced these tools of human-centered design research, particularly co-creation and co-design. And we've added our own long processes around what the media mostly calls design thinking. And here's what that looks like. So we start off with design research. We adapted the best methods from a lot of outside disciplines. So I don't take credit on behalf of designers for inventing any of this. It's a bit of a hodgepodge pulled from a whole lot of different disciplines. We start with um, evidence-led research from the so-called hard sciences. So we embrace that term because without evidence, we're just playing. As soon as we can bring evidence to the table when we're talking to people who work in health, whatever that kind of evidence is, they listen to the solutions we're proposing with a lot more attention. From the soft social sciences, we took action research and qualitative analysis techniques. And from Scandinavia in the 60s, we applied their ideas around participatory design. Our own spin on these two methods gave us research tools of co-creation to gain empathy for the stakeholders in any problem space. Then from that empathetic understanding of the problem space, we then start to generate concepts. And we workshopped a little bit of this process this afternoon. So that um, idea generating stage was originally championed again in the 70s by a man called Edward de Bono who tried to apply some uh, predictability and some rationality to what he, what he termed lateral thinking, a different way of framing creative problem solving. He gave a credibility, a defined process to encourage innovation. His ideas were the easiest for us, they fit, but they gave us more rigor about the iterative process. This process included questioning assumptions. So we all bring to a project or problem unconscious assumptions. And it's important to understand these assumptions as well as the assumptions of others. The next thing he talked about was uh, brainstorming or generating alternatives, ideation, never being satisfied for the first or second or third concept that you come up with, but push yourself to a dozen or 50, or in my case, when I work with students, 100 ideas around a concept. It's only when you start pushing through the first few obvious ideas that you start to get at something genuinely more creative later. He talked about suspending judgment. So if when you're designing something, you're always saying, well, that's not gonna work as it is, or we can't do that because of this problem here, you never get anywhere. So it's allowing yourself the space to say, okay, for the next hour or two hours or five days, whatever the period is, we're not gonna judge these ideas, we're just gonna generate a whole bunch of wacky ideas. Not worry about it because the strangest ideas often lead to, a, to an interesting idea that ultimately will be workable. Um, and then importantly, while this phase can be led by designers, for Design 4.0, it can and should include various stakeholders who aren't designers, particularly with complex problems, because designers are never the, the knowledge holders of an area that we, we work with. We will never be experts in health and healthcare. You guys are the experts in health and healthcare, or actually more accurately, patients would be as well, and they need to be included. So a designer's role here is to, is to facilitate a process by which non-designers can contribute to that space of emerging solutions, and that's called co-design. So with wicked problems, solutions need to be posed collectively based on both internal and external perspectives. So we ended up with a way to do what we've always been doing, proposing these wonderful solutions to problems, but now we were also able to base them on research, on the tacit knowledge that we're able to elicit from participants. We had reasons behind our decisions. But there are challenges as well at this stage. So with wicked problems, how do you predict which ideas might work when the consequences of error are so high? And for that last step in the process of proving our design, we turned to engineering and their ideas of rapid prototyping and testing. So wherever we're given the opportunity, we, we engage in user testing. We can now show that our solutions work through um, sort of field testing of them. So I'm going to show you some examples of projects in healthcare that use these tools. Most of them dealt with the general question of how to boost patient engagement in different aspects of their own care. Some are pretty straightforward. And I'll start with this first one. So they all build like this. So here's how a so-called fairly simple, straightforward problem around patient engagement escalates into a wicked problem. 
So we're going to talk about patient engagement. Great, but you can't really talk about patient engagement without talking about their families because families are a huge part in how people heal. But what defines a family? Uh, and what about when the patient doesn't want their family engaged, which happens in some cases? And how about cultural differences and expectations around family? How do we accommodate for those cultural differences? So we can't talk about any of this without talking about the healthcare system itself. Healthcare doesn't exist in a vacuum. It exists within this big, wonderful kind of structure. Patient engagement has to exist within that administrative structure, both the people in the structure as well as the data. But like any system, it's largely been set up for the convenience of the people using the system, not for the understanding of the people who are engaging with the system. Then, of course, we need to talk to nurses. Nurses form a huge part of the daily contact with patients, but they're all often also abused by family members quite strongly. How do we balance their need to do their job safely with the patient's right to understanding what's being done? Then we talk about doctors. So um, historically, we've elevated doctors to this almost godlike role of heal me, make me better. And largely, many of them live up or try to live up to that. Um, but it doesn't help when we bring to them uh, whatever we've Googled about our disease and handed it and said, look, we fixed it. We, we solved the problem for you. They love that. I tried it. Not so much. And it gets into patients' behavior. Pa patients rarely follow logical behavior. So another project I was engaged with was um, exploring why patients don't adhere to their medication prescriptions. Why? Apparently only 50% of patients take their medication as described, particularly among the elderly. So that's again a very complex problem in patient care. Then you end up in this insane space of interconnected problems that have to seem to have no way in. There's no way to start even thinking about them, so we often default to inaction. It's like, okay, look, we're done. We can't really fix any one part of this. Let's just stop. <coughs> So this is sort of the context of a wicked problem. So here's the first project I looked at. So this, uh, the first project, and this was several years ago, we were asked to look at hand hygiene. Originally, we were asked to explore why doctors aren't wonderful about uh, sterilizing their hands between seeing each patient. And we thought, okay, that's a good problem. We can work with that. And only politically, that became very problematic, and we were asked to stop very soon because the hospital admin people didn't want to deal with the, the issues of, of power and imbalance between doctors and them. So we were asked now to look at, okay, well, let's just look at how do we boost hand hygiene for visitors to a hospital? So what I'm going to show you a little bit is the process we went through. So mostly we engaged in this project with uh, nurse participants. It should have been a much bigger space than that, but that was all I was given access to. So for most of the participants, it's the first time that anybody ever asked what they think, which is funny because they're the holders of so much essential knowledge and without their understanding, we never would have been able to get very far. So at a conference last year, I presented some of these ideas and during a Q&A period, this nurse, this uh, union nurse put up her hand and said, we've been telling people this for 30 years, but nobody's been listening. So I, the only thing I could think of to say was we're, we're listening now. So the power of doing this is twofold. One, we get the knowledge of the nurses and the nurses felt listened to, which is really, really powerful in co-creation is the people you engage with feel they're being heard. So these are some, I won't go through what all of these are. It's this, although this one was looking at the symbolism of various colors within a hospital context, important for designers because we tend to pick colors that we think are useful colors and they'll fit together. But these colors had really clear values to, to the nurses and we needed to understand that. I can't remember where this one is. This one was funny. So this is one of my favorite stories. So I had two students who, who designed these really, really ugly sock puppets. Or not sock puppets. They were just these amorphous puppets. And they wanted to bring these puppets in and, and do some kind of game with the nurses. And I said, listen, I'm sorry. I've got to say no. It doesn't seem professional. It seems puerile. It seems like something you do with very young children. I can't see it as, as, as uh, appropriate for the context. So I said, OK, Jonathan, that's fine. They went away, they came back the day of the role of the, the co-creation with these puppets and insisted on doing it. I love students sometimes, but they, in this case, they definitely proved me wrong. So th that one day we had this one grumpy male nurse who really didn't want to be there. He had this whole body language thing going. He's sitting back in the wall. He just wanted all, all to feel like we were wasting all of their time. So I did my best to engage him and play politics. It wasn't working too well until we got to this one particular thing. The one thing I was the most afraid of were these students with these sock puppets. And I thought, God, if he hates everything else we're doing, he's going to just lay into these students. 
oddly, he got right into it because what the students were doing with these puppets was asking the nurse participants to role play the power dynamic between nurses and doctors. And we learned so much. I had no idea this I, I have now, <laughs> but at this time I had no idea about that power imbalance. And the students were right. By using this wonderfully weird, funny looking thing, they got so much information from, from the nurses about this power dynamic. So I know the talk is uh, focused on process, but people always want to see where we ended up with. So I've got a few examples here. So one student group, there were, I think, 60 students involved in this. So I'm only showing two results. One group posited the idea that <clears throat> they could set up a theoretical zone around which people would understand this is the dirty zone and this is the clean zone. And to test it, they actually put blue tape around a table, invited nurses to come and talk to them. And the nurses would go up to the blue tape but wouldn't cross the blue tape, even spite of not being told to do anything. So this was one part of it. The same group developed <clears throat> the idea of applying elevator wraps or putting wraps on elevators with silly sayings. And it seems pretty obvious from a marketing point of view, wraps are everywhere. But to the best of our knowledge, four or five years ago, no hospital had ever done elevator wraps. And they tweeted these things, and across Canada, people were ripping it off the idea of putting elevator wraps on hospitals. As far as I know, it was the first wrap that was done, certainly in Canada. And then they did start more posters because they insisted on posters, but at least these posters made people laugh. And then another group came up with an idea uh, because I didn't limit the solutions to being communication design. And some students who thought, well, let's do an interaction design project. So what they did is they hacked uh, using Arduino and uh, uh, I think processing was the application, uh, a device that every time you, you use the hand hygiene dispenser, it triggered something. And the thing they decided to make it trigger was this funny blooping noise that went through the, the it, was just, it was sort of amplified as bloop. And then it ended, added a hand up to an interactive graphic on a large monitor above them. And that hand would then slowly fade and become part of the background of hand. So you were encouraged to use this. And that simple interactive bloop and hand had people so engaged. There were a total of six devices at this one entrance, five just normal that weren't being, uh, weren't connected to anything. I guess the controls, if you will, and ours. People were ignoring the five that were just regular and sterilizers was to line up to use this one. So I thought that was great. Um, it really gave people a, a, a sense of the power of design to change behavior if it's done properly. So the, uh, Vancouver Coastal Health, which is the authority doing that, is now working uh, to connect these wirelessly and implement them at much more entrances. And a research group in Alberta is now looking at uh, control and, and um, to see to actually build some data around this, whether or not this can be successful. Another project I worked on um, in 2010 was uh, looking at the, the problem space of residential care beds in BC. So at that time, um, every residential care bed in BC had access to a lift uh, to move patients in and out of beds and into wheelchairs. The problems was the care aides didn't always use the lifts. Often they would just say, oh, it's easy, I'll just do it myself. They would injure themselves and go and work in compensation. Um, and that was costing uh, just the province of BC alone $8 million a year in claims. So they came to us and said, well, how can we how can we fix this? If they've got lifts, they're not using them. What do we do? They really thought they wanted a poster telling Gates to do this. But of course, with my shtick, I, I wouldn't go to the poster. So what we did there is we engaged with the residential care aides directly, as well as the supervisors. And we did it separately. We always try to separate groups. Because if you mix people from different power dynamics in one group, you get a very different result than if you just work with one group and just work with the other group. So similar to the hand hygiene project, the first designs you can see are co-creation exercises. Um, and this one was a scenario map. So what we were hoping to find was where the stress points in their day occurred. Where, what were the emotions they felt at different points and what caused them? Where were the problems and where might the opportunities for design intervention be? So you can see here what they're doing is mapping. I think this was the timeline. This was what they were, what they were doing and these are sort of the emotions. And we usually gave them silly little stickers, um, partly to make a, a sort of a workshop out of it. Um, you could just have written down the emotions, but also to encourage them to consider emotions they otherwise might not have thought of. Another view of the scenario map, uh, several other workshops, or several other um, interactive interactions as well. 
And so what we ended up um, finding was that at some facilities, these relatively low paid, mostly immigrant workers were largely disconnected from each other. The culture in the system within the facilities mostly discouraged workers' interaction and mutual help, and that's why they were getting injured. It wasn't because they didn't know how to use the lift, it was because some, because some techniques required two people to activate the lift properly, and they didn't feel comfortable enough asking for help. So the culture was essentially um, encouraging, and I can do this myself culture, instead of let's do it together and not injure ourselves. So the proposed design solution, which was implemented at a few test sites, was to build a sense of community among workers. So we tried to address the problem of back pain through community building, hoping that that would create an environment where mutual assistance was more the norm than the exception. And they did a wide range of project or products that might do this. Um, so we couldn't just so the stay safe, we couldn't just tell them to, to be careful because they didn't care about their own health. So we tried to encourage them to think of other people who would be affected by their lack of health, whether it was children or a spouse, partner, to, to give them a reason to stay safe. We gave them uh, messages. So we tried to build a relationship between younger aides and older aides through the mutual sharing of tips. So a way that the older aides could say, yeah, when you're doing this, here are some things that you might consider doing to build some trust between the older and younger aides. And we put a bulletin board together to try to humanize one little area of the space that they had that they could put sort of individual pictures of their family or whatever, to build a sense of this is who we are together. The next project, which is quite recent, was an, a project around uh, autism. So this was last year. A local entrepreneur and philanthropist in Vancouver um, with a child on the autism spectrum, successfully raised funds and petitioned government to support the building of a new facility that would coordinate autism services to families across BC. Because in Canada right now, if your child's diagnosed with ASD, um, you're given a certain amount of money and then you're left on your own. So these poor parents are, are having to cope with a child on the spectrum that they have no training and no way to deal with. They're given some cash, but they don't know how to spend it. They don't know what to do with it. So they asked us to oh, I don't know what that was. So they asked us to go to centers across BC to work with parents of children in the spectrum to see what those needs were and to see what connections parents might make between the needs and current research. Because this new facility was partly for researchers. So researchers could get access to parents of children on the spectrum and for parents to be able to access services, a mutually beneficial. But without parents' cooperation and buy-in for the research, it was doomed. There was no way this was going to go forward, and they didn't know what to do with it. So what we did here was we built this literal model where parents could establish their needs, propose research that was relevant to them, and then make connections with string, as I'll show you, between their needs and what was happening in research. And we traveled around BC meeting with different groups um, to learn about where they were at. So this was the first um, uh, activity within the workshop. Uh, called a journey map. Parents would map out their journeys from the diagnosis of the child in the top left corner through to their current situation, probably at the bottom right. And it had two goals. This first was an icebreaker activity. We had to get these parents comfortable enough with each other because they were mostly strangers to each other and with our student researchers to be able to talk about some issues that were deeply personal. So what we had asked them to do was to sort of map out their journey, indicate where they got stuck in their process with their child, uh, what, what worked, what didn't work, what their emotions were, what their frustrations were. Um, and it acted to connect these parents with each other because it was a joint activity. They didn't do this individually, but as a group together. So that became a really unexpectedly rich source of information. Parents were just, they were right into it. They were talking with each other. They were talking to us. They were crying. My, my students were reacting. <clears throat> it was manageable, it was, but it was very emotional space. Then we kind of gently, once they move from that activity, we move them into a block activity. So here what we did was we gave them sort of nine different general categories that we pulled from the research about what parent, uh, families with children on the spectrum mostly needed. And then we gave them these, these blocks that had labels that they could stick on them that we thought they might want, or we gave them pens and they could write their own down. And they then would take these blocks the, of needs and put them in whatever category they felt they belonged to. Then we gave them a different set of blocks 
which represented research. So the long, narrow blocks represented areas of research. We looked at the, all the research in autism that was happening in BC, put a label together for it, but also did some blanks so parents could suggest their own areas of research. And then we did these little comment stickers. So those little funny bubble things were places where people could write out a little more complex information or reasons why they put this need or this research together. And those were fascinating in terms of a rich source of information. And then we asked them to actually connect research to need, literally with string. Um, so that we could see the associations that they brought that, oh, well, this kind of research connects to what I need here. Because largely, we found the researchers were very well-intentioned and fascinated, but sort of myopically focused on the problem and not really how their solution or their input into that problem might affect a family later. And we were looking to see how families might react to that. In no way supplanting the research that was happening, just as a, to add another dimension to those researchers. And then these, this would be sort of the final complex board that would, we would end up with. And we would um, document all this with photographs and we would audio record the, uh, the, uh, the statements that people were making as well. The results were really amazing. Parents were engaged. They embraced the activities with so much enthusiasm and intent. They shared these incredible stories of what it was like to raise a child on the spectrum. Um, they talked about their feelings. They made a point of telling us, and this is really important, how grateful they were to be included in the process. They, they were really happy to contribute their time, even though their contribution made a tiny dent in ultimately where the project was going, but they at least felt part of it. And they were grateful to be included in it. And the other outcome, which was intended, was the students who later would have to compile this research were also deeply moved. They really developed a sense of empathy for these parents. So how do we move from this abstract space towards actionable deliverables? I get asked that question a lot. We have all this warm, sad, fuzzy stuff. That's great. What do you do with that? How do you deal with it? What's, where's the data? So what we do is this designer is sticky notes. Every single little bit of information, every block, every piece of string, every comment card, I have this massive room of students um, write down on a separate sticky note. Then what we, so we think of each one of those as a separate bit of information. Then we, in a freeform way, start linking them together for notes that have some kind of affinity for each other, like groups. And we call it essentially affinity mapping. So this project was way more complex than others by far because we also had to protect the relationships between bits of information, which was, which was complicated. And then, um, then, of course, we wrote about this in an extended research summary. But we also gave them a table where they could see what every single listed parent need was and what category it fell into. But more interestingly, we ended up, just so they could visualize it, this is static, but it's actually an interactive graphic, which one of my more co-savvy students was able to develop. So as you would kind of mouse over or hover, you would see which thing revealed, which area of research revealed which need or what it might be connected to. So that was quite interesting. So the last project I'm gonna talk about um, is a, a much bigger project. We were asked by a health authority, uh, in this case, Fraser Health in Vancouver, to look at how do we boost patient engagement in their own care with the goal of increasing safety within the hospital. So we were asking the, the patients to take a role in protecting their own safety in the hospital. So this is the context. This may be old news to you, but have you all seen this graph? If you haven't, it's, it's, it's very revealing, except that the next one. So this was given to me by the VP at, the, at Fraser Health. Um, so this is interesting because it reveals how dangerous hospitals are. The graph compares the risk of various activities. The, so the x-axis shows the number of encounters per fatality. The y-axis, the total number of fatalities. So we can see that being admitted to a hospital carries about the same level of risk as mountain climbing, not including the injury or illness which has taken you there in the first place. So just going in and being admitted to the hospital has that same level of risk. So how do we engage patients in dealing with this without scaring the crap out of them? That's kind of the challenge we were placed in. So here's how we work. We did separate co-creation sessions with the public, with nurses, with LPNs, with management, patient advisory, allied professionals, and patients separate from um, the advisory board, which I'll talk about in a sec. And as I mentioned a moment ago, we dealt with all of them in separate groups so we could get a lot more accurate information. 
So there are a few examples coming up to give a brief overview of the kind of things we were testing for. We had different kits for each group because we were looking to learn about different things from each group. What we didn't do is ask direct questions. So in co-creation, how it differs from focus groups is that we don't typically ask questions because if you're asking questions, you get some interesting answers to your questions, but you'll never reveal information around things that you didn't know to ask about. So when essential focus groups are biased by the questions that you put down. So the first group we worked with were allied health workers. So here we probed for their role in hospitals and we had them identify challenges they encountered working with patients, but also with staff, allied professionals being the people who would come into hospitals from outside the services. We went to the Patient Advisory Council, which is what they call it in uh, Canada. I don't know what they call it here, but most hospitals now have some kind of advisory board filled with patients or former patients. Um, and we asked them to identify patient emotions in various situations. And it was, uh, as you can imagine, a very animated discussion. So what we had them do is associate words to images and used emotional sticky notes to create this patient journey, as well as imagining a dialogue between a patient and a, and a doctor. We also had them identify specific areas of patient risk. So this was the patients doing this. Um, then we talked to management. In management, we wanted to look at the broader picture. So what are the systemic problems? What as an administrator do you have trouble with in the hospital? Um, we probed issues related to that management of risk. We asked them to do some scenario mapping. So outlining the paths of an incident. So we would ask the management to say, okay, think of the last incident at a hospital. Um, what happened in order for it? What had to be happening wrong beforehand to allow that incident to happen? We asked nurses to look at an images of an operating room uh, and indicate areas of risk. So what visually about this was risky? And then we wanted to work with patients in the hospital. So working with patient advisors, like the formal patient advisory groups is great and that's what they're intended for. But they become very uh, much advocates, almost activists, some of them. And we ended up seeing the same ones at different groups. They kind of go their rounds. So the, I think that's a very useful group to go to, but you're not getting in the moment information. And we asked Fraser Health if we could actually talk to patients. That raised, uh, understandably, a lot of ethical issues. And we had to do a fair bit of work preparing um, and, and, and going through ethical boundaries for, or the ethical board for that. But it was quite interesting. Um, so what we did develop was an interactive device on an iPad to try, because we couldn't bring the patients into a co-creation event. There were way too many issues around infection, around cross, and it was just very difficult. But we had students go in and talk to them and build as close as we could a genuinely co-creative space with them. And this was an interactive app that allowed patients to engage in a similar way. So they could drag words to images. They could use sliders to convey emotions. Um, so there was definitely engagement beyond just the simple conversation, and we were able to track that information. So then this is the results analysis. So as the um, autism project, every single bit of information had to be recorded on a separate sticky note. Um, and, and that took a uh, week. So I had, I think, 15 students on this project, and they would spend um, week after week sort of doing the sticky notes, creating the affinity maps. And then this is so, we, and we did a separate one for each group that we worked with. So we cataloged every response and there were hundreds and hundreds of sticky notes and grouped them according to themes. That in and of itself was interesting, but not particularly useful in terms that it wasn't actionable. So what we did then was break that down into principles. So here are the themes that emerged from this research. What design principles would we extract from that so we can base decisions on that moving forward? Then for every principle, we looked at, we developed a cognitive map. What are ways that we might affect change around that principle? And then we went through the brainstorming uh, phase and we, um, what we did today in our workshop was we sort of iterated half a dozen different ideas. What I had the students do here was take two full classrooms, floor to ceiling brown paper, and cover them with ideas. So there were hundreds of concepts. It took them a couple of weeks to get there. At that point, we invited the executive team. So this is not sort of um, a side committee. This was the CEO, uh, president, VPs for this local health authority. So these were people with decision-making authority. 
We asked them to come and join us to help clarify what they wanted out of this and to act as co-designers, as co-creators in this process. So this was kind of an abbreviated co-design phase. So the funny thing about this um, is I, I, I sent out a note to the person who's coordinating this and I said, so we'd like to bring your executive team into our messy studio. Uh, we're going to do some fun work. Uh, maybe you can tell them not to, not to wear their suits that day. So I got a pause and I got this email back and they said, I think we need an agenda. So I emailed back and I said, um, well, the agenda is we're just going to draw and do some stuff and talk about it. She goes, yeah, I need you to write that up so I can submit it to the board. So I went away, I wrote up an agenda that said five minutes introduction, 10 minutes design brief, an hour and 10 minutes co-creation. So I think they either got bored of asking me to do, do an agenda or she just submitted that and then accepted it, but it worked. And so they showed up in what the closest thing they had to jeans and a t-shirt was. And on the left, that's a man called Nigel Murray, who was the, uh, at the time, he was the CEO of Fraser Health Authority, which had a multiple. So I was really excited to get a man at that level into the studio, pair him with the student and start generating more ideas. Because the purpose here was, what would a health executive team, when paired with the designer, what could they come up with? So what we ended up with was agreement on three deliverables because they actually wanted to move into implementation somehow. So we ended up with a tiered approach to suggesting change. All of the approaches were based on the principle of putting patients first. Hardly groundbreaking, so many, many of this do that. But we had a few new twists on the change. So the first thing we do, this was the head of the nursing union was part of this team, and she asked for something implementable that they could do with uh, whiteboards as a messaging system. She wanted something they could actually make happen because she knew that left to her own devices, we'd do some up, off the wall thing that had never happened. So reluctantly we said yes, because this isn't particularly sexy for us, but she had a point and this actually happened. So we developed a template, a way to standardize the use of a whiteboard that would have a patient's name, the language, uh, their mobility, who the care team was, uh, the plan for the day and a message board, a message area. And the purpose of the message area was so family could write down a quick note for the care team the next day that they might not interact with. It could be as simple as saying, my mother had a crappy night, could you let her sleep in? Or my mom was asking about pain, could you check the medication? Or the nurses could say, and then nurses could leave a message for the family saying, your mom had a bit of a hard day today, um, you know, I'll, I'll fill you in tomorrow. And it clearly privacy became an issue here, and we talked about that, but this would be something that the patient could inform. The patient could talk with their care team about their, what they're comfortable sharing or not. Um, so it wasn't pretty in any sense. So this is not design making it pretty. I was not proud of this as a piece of design, but as a way of changing behavior, it was, I think, quite an effective tool. The next one we looked at was hand hygiene. And in this case, we did tackle the issue of doctors moving from patient to patient to patient without, change, without washing their hands or sterilizing their hands each time. And I, I, forgive me for a stupid question, but here uh, in the States, when you cough, do you cough through your arm or sneeze through your arm? Is that like a thing? Yeah, yeah. okay, sneeze through your arm. Yeah, okay. So um, I, I don't know where that started, but where I live, nobody coughs or sneezes into their hand. Everybody coughs or sneezes into their, into their arm. And when you think about it, how did that happen? No one told us to do it. All of a sudden, it just became a thing. It became a different way of sneezing, and now we mostly do it. So we proposed the idea of, what's, well, let's change the ritual of a greeting in a hospital between a doctor and a patient. And let's make that ritual about mutual hand washing or hand sterilizing. So perhaps the doctor would, out of their pocket, take paper and hand one to the patient, and they would both sterilize their hands and put it away. Seems like a silly idea, but it answered a few different things. And it would also be used not just between doctor and patient, but between every interaction with the patient. So when the family came in, because families also notoriously don't always sterilize their hands, so they too, before they said hi to mom, would wash their hands. And, and the fact that they would do it together meant nobody had to challenge somebody in a position of authority to say to them, would you wash your hands, please? Because patients that which told us they'd feel very uncomfortable challenging a doctor on that. So that was kind of interesting. And um, I'm not sure whether they've tried to adapt this, but they were quite excited about the idea. So but the sexy part of the project for us was um, uh, yet another app, a patient health record app. You've probably seen many of them. Um, but this was one that my students were interested in. So this one uh, put patients quite functionally, but also quite symbolically at the center of a circle of trust. So those caregivers and family members that are there to help them in. So around that circle, you would see in the, the middle was the patient, you'd have the nurse, you would have the doctor, you would have the care team, and you might have the family. 
So here you can click on something, you can find a little bit more out about the care team. In theory, the idea for us, and this one was not gonna be implemented. We were, we were encouraged by the CEO to really think um, future, think like, well, what could we do down the line? So the theory behind this is that, th that this would pull from the hospital health record system, so the data would feed this more or less automatically. Uh, they could click on something, get a little more detailed information about their care team, so maybe they could open up something about, look at their nurse, hear something about their nurse. Uh, one thing I thought was interesting was it wasn't our idea necessarily, but the CEO really wanted some kind of rating system within that. And I just saw so many issues around, can you imagine the poor nurse who gets downvoted while other nurses are getting upvoted? So we built a one-way system. So it's not like rate my MD, it's more like Facebook. You could like a nurse or, or give a nurse a, a brownie point. So you could only say essentially good things. We also create an agenda. So um, when, pa when, pa when family came to see what was going on with their loved one and the loved one wasn't there, they could figure out where they might be and whether they should wait or come back. And to avoid medication errors, one of the big three that, that harm people when medication errors happen is a list of what medications they were on with images, not only of what the pill looked like, but how many they were supposed to take. So that if the family or the patient ever had a question about it, well, are you sure this is my pill? They could compare it, that they would know instinct, not instinctively, they would know accurately this was the pill that I had to take. So I'm going to try to summarize what I've been talking about. Most of us think of design when we think of it at all as a way to make something look a little better, maybe even work a little better. But we don't usually think of it as a different way of approaching a problem in the first place. Truly, it's a different way of thinking. It's a replicable process for approaching a problem. And while it's no guarantee that the outcomes will be any more successful necessarily, it most certainly guarantees a better understanding of the problem. And from that direction, we may end up in a better place. Mostly, it's simply about shifting focus. Designers used to be taught to work with type, color, image, and they still are to some extent. And we're taught to accept a client or a problem at face value. If a client comes to us, uh, they want a poster to make a change in the workplace. We go, we develop a great poster, they put up the poster, and then it has kind of an okay effect, but it doesn't work exactly the way they thought. So instead of going back to the designer uh, and doing something else, they blame the designer and they go to another designer and think, well, let's get another designer to do a different poster, and maybe that poster this year will be a little bit better. And the cycle keeps going. But we don't really need to work that way. Now we can look past the simple solution the client might have asked for and push a little deeper. So I always say to a partner or client, what would success look like to you? And the answer is almost always some kind of behavior change. They want people to act differently in some kind of moment. So then I ask them, well, in your experience, has anyone ever changed because of a poster? And they mostly go, yeah, I guess not. And so then we're able to have a real conversation about what we might be able to do with that. And if it's not a poster, then what? So then I say to them, so what are you really trying to accomplish? What's the change you really want? What's the bigger question? You may think you want people to use hand sterilizers, but really what you want is reduced infection rates in the hospital. The hand sanitizer is, is one way to get there. Is there another way that we might get there? And are hand sanitizers still the most effective way to do that? And if so, are the problems, you know, can we solve that problem a different way? Next then, as a designer, I go away and I do the research. I research what other designers have done to solve that problem already, so I'm not just reinventing the wheel. You need to do, do some reading, do some reviews, make sure you're not doing the same thing over again. But you also need to engage with people at this stage directly, and preferably in some kind of open-ended manner, like co-creation, that allows people to participate in that change. And that's the key point behind what I'm doing. After that stage, we iterate lots of ideas. We refine to one or two. We test them, show them to people, see how they react. Do they understand? Do they respond predictably? Or is there some unintended consequence? Maybe the type's too small because I was 25 on a design type that I could read, while the 55-year-old couldn't read it. I'm still amazed how often a design gets implemented that has never been happened, never been tested. So that's what happened with the medication in the first few slides. It was designed, it was accepted, but was never actually field tested. So that's the end of my talk. So I'm gonna leave you with a couple of different points. First, design's a process, not an afterthought. Use designers in the process to help frame the problem itself 
and make sure you're working with a designer who at least intuitively understands this sort of design 4.0 approach, which is design as facilitator. The next is by building empathy and deep understanding of all the stakeholders, human-centered participatory design tools do offer us some hope to addressing some of these wicked problems. And the final note is that when people participate in forming change by contributing to the design process, they're much more likely to embrace the outcome and actually change their behavior. So that's kind of a key unintended side effect uh, of this kind of thing. And that's it. Thank you. So I'd be happy to uh, take questions. And I think there's a mic that we're going to use. Is that right for the audience? Do we need a mic or the director of Oh, these guys. First of all, thank you. Um, uh, I had a question. If you had any um, projects or practices working with um, both like children or youth, if you had any key takeaways and the differences on how to approach co-creation, particularly with youth kids. Thank you. Great question. Um, so yes, we had worked with children. Um, is this coming through this microphone? Uh, we did a project on one of them. I didn't show slides of it for obvious reasons, but we worked with um, children at a local cancer hospital. So these are children uh, who had been admitted to the hospital and were fighting cancer at one time. So there are huge issues there for sure. What we did is we built um, we built sort of an art craft process so that they could distance themselves. I'm not explaining this well. We didn't want to. We didn't want to trigger the children any more than had already been triggered. So we used a third party, but the idea of an alien, a super alien. And we said to them, if the super alien uh, came down to your hospital, what kind of problems would that super alien encounter in this hospital? What would they be doing? So we projected it out. And it actually had pretty good acceptance. Um, we didn't get a lot of results. Uh, and the age range was huge. It's hard to develop something that's going to work as well for a five-year-old as a 15-year-old. But we got some great results. And, and they did mostly. Um, and they weren't triggered by it, and parents were quite comfortable, obviously, we didn't get the parents involved in this. But that was a way that we managed to do it sort of as a third party question. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, thank you again very much for the talk. It was really informative. Um, I was at a conference recently, um, and around my dissertation research, and we were talking about um, biomedical products and devices that are used that have to go through long processes with the FDA. Um, and someone was presenting a human-centered design from the WHO and a great example um, sort of similar to what you presented today. And when they got to the part about talking about this particular type of device, they're like, yeah, and so we're working on figuring out how to apply these, these approaches to these devices that take a long time to go through yep. the approval process, but also in terms of like drug development, there's a lot of biologic research that has to be done in it. So they end up at one product, and then this iteration has to get gone through a whole other process. And so I was just wondering if you have experience with that type of design work and the time frame of I don't have any direct experience of that. I got a wonderful anecdote that shows the danger of not applying human-centered design to that process, and that's around an ultrasound machine. So uh, in Victoria, BC, we had a, a visitor from um, an industrial design studio in Victoria that specializes in medical product design, and he talked a lot about those time frames. And he would, they were asked to develop an ultrasound machine, uh, not a home-use one, but a proper one that was used in, within a facility. And they toured a facility, and in this, in this facility, they saw this brand beautiful new ultrasound machine covered in wraps, and they were using this, the old one. And they asked, they said, well, why, why, what's wrong with this brand new one? Why are you using this, this cool new one instead of this old one? 
and they, they kind of sheepishly, and this is key because they felt sheepish about their need to, um, and I have to put my mic down for a second, but what they were doing was they were putting the wand or whatever it's called on, on the person on the belly, and then on the other hand, they were moving their device because they wanted to look at the woman and the screen as they're managing the controls. And what this brand spanking new machine had done was give them a touch screen, which is wonderful in theory, and it's sexy technology to do all this stuff with the touch screen, but you have to look at it. And they couldn't look at the touch screen and look at the, at the woman because they're taking the ultrasound or at the, at the screen, so they abandoned it. They didn't engage in a human-centered process. If they had, they would have avoided mothballing this brand new thing, and they would have ended up with a better process. So I guess the bigger point that I'm trying to make is human-centered design doesn't take any longer. If anything, um, it just has to be part of the process at the start, and then you, they could have avoided a huge issue. I think I'm answering your question sideways. I think the other part of your question is about exploration. Yeah. Which I think is very inherent in the design thinking process. Yeah, so the iterative process has to happen. It has to happen no matter what's done. Um, iteration doesn't have to take a lot of time. Testing does. Um, but hopefully you can engage in um, testing of mock-ups before you're testing the final product because you wouldn't go through that whole process in medical equipment of, of many products. You would only want to test the one final one for sure or get one final one approved. But you can prototype and get all kinds of information from cardboard mock-ups, from, from quick and dirty kind of interactive devices that wouldn't take, uh, you wouldn't have to get the same approvals on that. Maybe I guess to prototype a lot and yeah. fail quickly. Yeah. Sanders and Sappers, S A N D E R S, Sappers, S T A P P E R S. And the book is called, I'll, I'll look it up. I can, I'll email it to Terry and you can distribute it. But uh, if you Google those two, they, they, this is a research area and they have the Bible on appropriation. Uh, and it's it's uh, wonderful and it's very accessible. And it has uh, many different pictures. Thank you. There are some um, really useful. Was tremendous. I really loved it. Um, I've always just, I was just curious about how you go about budgeting or, or, or sort of like playing out the design process where you are doing the brainstorming portions of your projects. Because everyone is always so concerned about cost, and the means to get these ideas, you need to have some way of cost or buying time or an annual spend just to get to generate them um, in order to move forward. Because you know, I just think that'd be interesting. Yeah. So, how did you think this up? Um, it's like uh, the old joke, well, how long is a piece of string, essentially? So when, when partners or clients ask me to budget or quote something, mostly I turn it around and say, it's going to be a lot easier to just tell me the budget. Then when I have the budget, then I can put together, okay, I can afford to hire X number of people to do X number of appropriation. The, the brainstorming process, it's not as um, unpredictable as you would think. I would never guarantee to a client, I'm going to come up with the one new iPad that's going to change the world. I would simply promise a process. Um, and I might promise, um, you know, I will spend two weeks and generate 100 alternatives and we'll get it back to them. That's as accurate as I can be at this stage. But honestly, it, it comes down to what kind of client I have. That's the kind of like the, that's a better process. Okay. Um, I'm going to ask you to so there's universal design, which um, you know, is designed to uh, allow people to do things throughout their life cycle. But the hand washing example you gave is so culturally unique. So in a field like Vancouver, how do you bring people together in a 
design process to create a system that may be so varied by cultural backgrounds, um, age groups, etc. Um, you mean specifically? Imagine that people are coming to San Francisco from very different political and cultural perspectives. I guess some would refer to pulling rather than pushing. So I think always coming up with an idea and then saying to people, this is how it has to happen, it's never going to work. So if that idea had merit and if, if the authority wanted to pursue that idea in more detail, I would have gone and I would have pulled from as many different cultural groups as I could have and said, so we kind of think we might get to this place. How can we do that together and, and let them think of the ideas? Um, there's no way to use co-creation to push a predetermined idea down to somebody that's serving the purposes of the whole thing. So I think that's the best thing I can say is to make sure you're representing those cultural groups. Yes. Go ahead. Um, so I think that the From my classes, not as you kind of learn that, but the problem is kind of go upstream and upstream and upstream. And in your example of Christian and PhD students at the same peak, uh, I was thinking of the physician example where it's such a continuous practice between the clinician and the patient. Mm -hmm. But if a clinician were to say, Gosh, I just really feel pressure, you know, I have all of these time constraints on me to see multiple patients, and that's kind of at the end of the day what drives my behavior. Uh, I was just wondering if you could maybe speak to the extent to which you have defined problems. So if all of a sudden it becomes a, a structural or a, a systemic problem, you know, what, what is your role in addressing that or where, where do you draw the line? It always becomes a systemic problem. And, and yes, we, we're never able to get doctors to participate in these co-creation events. If you guys ever figure out the magic of how to get doctors into this thing, and that's, you know, that's the way you have, because that's huge. Um, yeah, the doctors had huge issues with doing that. Yes, they had huge time constraints. So I would have loved to engage with them and say, so can we agree that hand hygiene has to happen? Like we did that, yes. How could it happen then? Work with them to bring that answer from them. Um, there's no way to tell a doctor or any group what to do. You have to let the solution originate with that group. So maybe out of that, the doctors would have their own thing. But maybe what they say was, well, you know what the problem is? is it's the dispensers in the hall, and I've got to talk to the patient here. I'm not going to go in and out of the room five times to dispense my hand. In that case, the solution is simple. Put the, put the dispensers where the patients are. I mean, it could be as simple as that. I don't know the answer. But there is no way to artificially limit it. You have to accept the wicked problem goes out, and you have to follow as many of those paths as you can, or you're always going to get into a case where, no, we can't do that because this one thing you didn't think of is going to drive into this problem. So actually, I have a very quick question that goes yep. on that question. It relates to what you said at the beginning of your talk based research. Um, so, you know, in Emily's example, you know, I can imagine that, for example, the time you would identify, say, if you're going downtown to visit one of the town residents, you know, could be willing to try this out, right? Um, and then we need to come up with data to show that, you know, uh, patient satisfaction or, you know, whatever, patient outcomes, you know, are improving, you know, as these uh, early early adopting physicians you know, are testing their hypothesis. Um, and then hopefully, you know, data will then be brought to division meetings and department meetings, um, and then eventually in the lab is, you know, along. So um, from your point of view as a designer, um, you know, what what is evidence-based uh, design? You know, and, and how do you how, how do we how do we build that evidence, right? Um, you know, because a lot of the design um, and so how do we actually study the whole design? I think it's unrealistic to expect human-centered design to follow the same kind of protocols. What we build is knowledge. Um, it's not evidence-led in the sense that here's the data that supports what I'm doing. It could be, but I think it's too much to do that at the beginning stages. So everything we talked about today is, is pro proposing ideas. What you're talking about is once we were implementing an idea, can we measure change? Uh, and I think that's hugely relevant because without it, you're right, there is no data that's going to sell a scientist that this is actually going to be helpful. But I'm talking about the process up to that point. I think designers aren't academics. We're, we're not ever going to be able to build the kind of study you're talking about. But 
problems with that are the Gentieri. I don't think designers are the right one to solve it necessarily. I mean, I mean, I think I think you guys would be more helpful at, at that stage for sure. And also, they're transdisciplinary. Yeah, absolutely. Are there any questions? Any other questions? Well, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you for having me. Yeah.